Hello everyone, I am Tag. And this is Bob. And you are listening to Bob and Tag Talk. Before we start the show, I would like to point out that the topics discussed on Bob and Tag Talk are for informational purposes only. So please do not take this as investment advice. We urge you to do your own research before making any investment. Alright, so today we are going to talk about uh, what are digital assets and what are the digital assets of today. So what do you think comes under digital assets? So anything that is art in the old world and if you convert something like art to the in the modern world and when you make art through coding mm-hmm. or you make art through any kind of digital tools mm-hmm. so generally those we term it as digital assets but it's not just limited to art it can even go beyond that mm-hmm. so it can go to documents or it can go to some any kind of uh, like stamps and then comics and any popular culture related things mm-hmm. they're all also anything like that the sub collectibles mm-hmm. they're also can be uh, are coming under digital assets these days but uh, the idea is that it can only be considered a digit- an asset if it generates some sort of value right i did it has to have an inherent value mm-hmm. so for example uh, there are, there used to be a lot of collection of comic books and comic book enthusiasts right. who really put some value on a special editions or a particular edition mm-hmm. and then with a limited editions mm-hmm. so uh, as it becomes limited it becomes exclusive it, it there's there's a value to it right right and the, uh, so basically what you mean are like a special edition comic books which is like uh, signed, signed by signed autograph uh, by Stanley yeah, yeah, or yeah. something stuff and like that even on sports like sports trading cards right right and i think there are even like very limited edition pokemon cards or something like that that's true. very valuable that's true and even watches limited edition watches oh okay if you know uh, Kevin O'Leary, right. one of the judges in Shark Tank, he has a great collection of watches. Right, right. And he's a true believer in digital, mm-hmm. uh, you know, collectibles. Mm-hmm. Because he has been collecting different, different watches of different unique companies, limited edition watches. Mm-hmm. And he also says that it's kind of diversification for him. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, those people really do believe in this digital art and digital collectibles. And it's interesting how uh, anybody can create digital art today and yes. make it monetizable. Yeah. So, uh, there was a time when, you know, book publishing used to be like really, really complex. You needed yes. to go and find publishers. You need to pitch your idea to them. Yes. And they'd have to like see if you were investable or not. Mm, now true. there are like e-publishing tools that can help you publish yes. things on your own. Like sitting at home, you write your book, you finish it. And yeah, you, you get you someone to proofread it and publish yeah. it. And the main thing of any kind of publishing a book or something like it's an, not exactly an asset, but it's it has something as an IP. Mm-hmm. It's your IP. So uh, it is something, uh, there's always uh, a legacy revenue attached to it. Right. So as in you as you sell more books, you mm-hmm. always get some revenue out of it. Okay. And it is like a, it is like a permanent piece of asset, like a real, real estate. Okay. So it's more of a real estate on the digital side. So when it comes to this e-publishing or any kind of normal publishing books, right? So authors who actually go through a publisher who publish their book, so their main source is like... Uh, royalties mm-hmm. so as their book becomes popular as they gain more readers uh, they will get a royalty out of the sales right and the royalty is like depending on the popularity of the author mm-hmm. so people who are starting on may get a two percent royalty or something and if they're really popular authors get up to 10 to 12 percent royalties mm-hmm. so the thing the idea is that usually uh, books never get popular immediately after it's published. Hmm. Sometimes it takes years. Like you take Game of Thrones. Right. Uh, I think the first Game of Thrones books was probably published in the 1990s. Yeah. And then probably uh, a few years after that, it, it was popular, but in a certain country or a certain region. Correct. And then after probably 98, or after the second or third book got published, it really became popular and, and it uh, all caught the fancies of all the fantasy readers. Correct. correct. Because of its good writing. So. Right. Really, some of these uh, uh, old school mm-hmm. publishing books things take mm-hmm. really time to mm-hmm. spread through and gain some momentum, mm-hmm. and then that is when the royalties start to come in for the author. But when it comes to the digital world, let's say you are creating some art and you are uh, really 
uh, how do you basically create a dig- how do you make that digital you generally create that using computers mm-hmm. and then you need to authenticate it mm-hmm. and then you make sure that that, that uh, you know how do you make sure that it is original right how do you make sure that it cannot be copied mm-hmm. it is not thing mm-hmm. it is little bit more easier on the digital side than in the mm-hmm. old school Um, so what you mentioned you know brings me back to music production yeah so uh, it's like um, when I started making music out of software yeah uh, obviously like you said it needs to be mine to make yes. uh, revenue yes. so one of the ways we do that is through copywriting yes. uh, and creating YouTube content ID so that you know uh, you can tell that this is mine so the revenue will come to me true so, yeah I understand what you're talking about when you mean that so it's very much easier to copyright these things these days mm-hmm. 50 years ago 30 years ago it was very difficult to keep track of copyrights and copyright infringements is very difficult to get it through legal right. uh, means and get it sorted out mm-hmm. now it's becoming more and more easier mm-hmm. and the best part is a uh, blockchain and nfts and cryptographic solutions are really making it easier f- for two things proof of authentication and proof of ownership mm-hmm. and uh, any other kind of proof that you need we can provide that through software mm-hmm. and that has really enabled this digital ecosystem and uh, our digital storage solutions or whatever it is and the digital economy itself yeah there is a separate economy that is really thriving today mm-hmm. provided yeah it is true that it is mainly in the development like us and europe probably mm-hmm. but uh, there is a lot of potential mm-hmm. and this is the potential that most of the software people are really concentrating on these days through nfts crypto solutions and then cryptocurrency is a little different because it's a currency that is for trading uh-huh. but uh, generally now there are real real companies mm. that are concentrating on how do you buy art mm. how do you authenticate art how do you auction art mm-hmm. and how is there a real track record of who has owned in the past few years and software and blockchain solutions and cryptographic solutions are making it really easy mm-hmm. so there's a real trust getting established and trust is the main part of any of these uh, transactions in the digital world so just like publishers authors moving into the digital world we have a lot of other economic activities that are happening today and we generally call it the gig economy like writers mm-hmm. and then uh, reviewers or uh, you know uh, some some kind of uh, digital people like for example you can write software mm-hmm. and then uh, basically you can write you don't have to do it on day to day every day so you have the option of working part time so you have the option of uh, doing all these things digital like verification of documents or, or taxations mm-hmm. taxation is one of the main things that is really taken on is really popular these days mm-hmm. everything is done online mm-hmm. all the tax systems are online all you need is a ca or an accountant to go through this it doesn't have to be present in an office mm-hmm. and uh, yeah and then lot of other uh, new age uh, digital things are also coming up like like we mentioned crypto nfts mm-hmm. arts mm-hmm. and then even like sports sports is also really trying to see how they can improve their economy mm-hmm. sporty economy in that in that basically how to how to do, bring things digitally yeah and all of this digital content has given rise to a lot of new very niche jobs like True. there are lots of freelancers these days mm-hmm. who do very niche jobs like writing uh, and even writing can be uh, categorized or not categorized they can be delved deeper like there are specific people who write just for social media True. specific people who write just blogs and digital just influencers yeah, yeah influencers also yeah, some so people make short videos short mm-hmm. clips mm-hmm. like all the initially initial days or previously uh, decades ago mm-hmm. we used to have advertisements in tv right now the ad industry is itself becoming so digital that digital influencers are being uh, brought in yeah. for uh, content creators i suppose content creators, I suppose. Content creators yeah. Yeah, yeah to talk about it in movie reviews mm-hmm. i mean movie reviews have totally uh, become a kind of a passion yeah. and turning that passion into yeah. something that can give you a it's revenue. amazing because you know you would have never really thought this would become a job in the in I mean, of course later. movie reviews was always a job but right. it's for, for basically for uh, the news publishing industry mm-hmm. they used to have reviewers mm-hmm. art critics who go in write a post or yeah. I mean write a really good long arc- article and yeah, like that yeah. but uh, youtube has completely changed it yeah. anyone can just post their reviews and mm. give their criticism on a particular mm. topic mm. it can be political it mm. can be art it can be movies mm. and popular culture is the main thing yeah. that is that's it's become it is more easier to spread fast mm-hmm. so True. that is the thing so yeah gig economy yeah 
so even the way we started this podcast we started it because you know we wanted to um uh, reach out to people and uh, uh hopefully teach them a little bit about investing in finance and how sure. the business world works mm-hmm. so um and it, it because of this digital economy it became really easy for us to start this podcast uh, to do a recording to put it on uh, places like spotify youtube it became really easy yeah and we have the technology to, to actually spread this kind of uh, messages or any kind of uh, you know our work then we we are really able to reach a particular audience mm-hmm. either we want to reach a niche audience mm-hmm. or we want to through the social media we want to reach a broad audience mm-hmm. it has never been this easier to get uh, you know eyeballs to a particular thing True. So, but the thing is there a lot of effort is involved it does definitely take time mm-hmm. but always the first uh, you know wave of people who have gone to social media twitter or any kind of a digital ecosystem or channel mm-hmm. like facebook or youtube mm-hmm. whatever it is can be any channel mm-hmm. any social media uh, site or something the first people who go in and establish a real communication and establish a following and then that's when they start generating revenue right yeah because and it takes time it takes obviously. time yeah. really takes time yeah. the thing is uh, doesn't take so much time as 50 years ago correct but definitely it takes one year is probably too long for people now but right. yeah yeah i understood yeah. and yeah uh, like hobbies have become monetizable and really if you, yeah, yeah if you take uh, the author of the book martian mm-hmm. and he actually wrote his book as a blog first mm-hmm. blogging used to be really popular decades ago <laughs> yeah. now it has become a little bit different the mm-hmm. people do blog but it's micro blogging and very specific niche blogging mm-hmm. but he started the story of Mar- martian as a blog mm-hmm. and eventually it became really popular and he self published it mm-hmm. then it became an audio book mm-hmm. audio book is something really again it's really in a boom it's these changing. days yeah, yeah, yeah audible from amazon is really yeah. concentrating on more content these days mm-hmm. so pe- a lot of companies are investing into it mm-hmm. and advertisers really want companies to create or or get more digital content mm-hmm. so the consumption has increased we have a lot of devices that we are connected to not just uh, laptops and TVs but we have uh, like iPods and then we have people who are working commuting they listen to short videos or a podcast and that has really started this uh, digital and economy and it is and, and it's really you know uh, encourage this gig economy mm-hmm. and uh, like we said about publishing and uh, other than publishing there are a lot of other examples as mm-hmm. well like comic books people now initially right uh, only marvel and dc and then they were really good comic book artists who work with these publishing houses mm-hmm. now there are a lot of new publishing houses mm-hmm. who are making comic books on digital art and then probably Uh, sending a newsletter to everyone and then advertising their products mm-hmm. on twitter you can see some new age comic books mm-hmm. new authors young authors mm-hmm. or young comic book artists mm-hmm. really coming up yeah and then i think it has even changed the gaming industry because as far mm-hmm. as i can tell <clears throat> it's uh, it's become a thing to like stream what you're gaming yes. yeah, like yes. a stream an entire walk through and you know just play a game yeah play a game record watch. it and publish it yeah yeah, yeah. so that has also changed mm-hmm. and uh, yeah that has uh, so basically what i'm trying to say is all this gig economy this freelancing it has made uh, sure that you know we don't need to really be tied to corporations to like get a job yes. we can get uh, jobs that you know uh, make us work from home um, yeah. and yeah not tied to anything but and there's also one significant other thing that is happening is let's say there has been a, it's actually a true story that uh, there's a very popular in, uh, investment manager mm-hmm. he wanted to write a book mm-hmm. so he went to a publisher and the publisher asked him to start a blog first right and then what what they actually started was start your digital profile first mm. get in followers get mm. in some buy in from some readers mm-hmm. and then you start a podcast get in some listeners mm-hmm. and once you have a following mm. and then meanwhile then you publish your book that makes a lot of sense no yeah. so that is one that so now all even standard publishing companies like a uh, lot of uh, popular random house and right. all the other publishing companies mm. follow this particular structure mm-hmm. so they create a kind of website they create social media uh, influencers and then social media presence and then podcasts mm-hmm. and even authors go into different people's podcasts mm-hmm. i don't i mean showcase right. their book or showcase that or whatever their uh, knowledge or whatever it is and then they just draw in these listeners and then they create a buzz about these books and then they publish it yeah. and then they release it makes sense Uh, and we can also see that uh, all these digital practices mm-hmm. how they are affecting the traditional practices as well mm. 
so if we take the example of uh, auctioning mm. so initially auction houses used to have a process of authenticating a particular product authenticating authenticating yeah mm. how do they authenticate the product how do they authenticate the owner they have to get the history correct. of who all owned it and things like that correct correct and uh, they need to establish a timeline right. and then they have to publish the timeline before auctioning the product so people who are really want to buy or in auctions yeah so they can verify they know the history oh. they need to know that okay this is from a legal source oh. or uh, you know there are taxations and other government rules and regulations involved mm. not just for that but also for establishing authenticity of the product like mm. for example uh, during the world war 2 there are a lot of artifacts that were stolen right. and then uh, they were eventually shared in private auctions mm-hmm. and then eventually they come up auction, auction after so many years mm-hmm. so auction houses have a real good practice of uh, making sure that uh, people who own it now are the le- actual legal owners and then um, they and the, if they how many times has it been exchanged how many times is it really uh, correct i mean they go through some museum art museum people to go through the, is it real real or not mm. and art is real mm. or not so a lot of people who really authenticate these things now what has happened is uh, there is a real potential of using uh, cryptography or this nft kind of uh, technologies to really make a kind of a unique code or a unique thing unique for a unique uh, you to know, that specific art to that particular not just art to the sale or a transaction okay okay so how do you identify a transaction how do you identify the parties in the transaction and everything can be done digitally mm-hmm. and you have a digital record of everything mm-hmm. basically it's a digital ledger mm-hmm. so that is the main uh, you know advantage of using a blockchain so you have the complete history it's public and then you know everything and then uh, you can basically it's easier to establish trust right and this is also uh, you know like uh, all the rich people who buy art as mm-hmm. an investment mm-hmm. so and then they buy lot of things like cars as an investment mm-hmm. like some special edition cars like mm-hmm. ferraris lamborghinis right. all these luxury cars yeah. luxury cars even sports people like cristiano ronaldo messi ah. they have their house full of cars right. and digital assets these are all like investments actually right. Right. so how do you safeguard these investments you need a lot of money to you know protect these things from security like from insurance like fire Got or it. from earthquakes and all things they have all these insurance things okay. so how how can digital you know economy or a digital uh, uh, blockchain things Fix. solve these problems mm-hmm. so one of the one company has really thought about is they have this warehouse mm-hmm. where it is earthquake proof mm-hmm. it is rain uh, rain and flood and all Whatever these protections fire protection and everything okay. they store all these arts in one particular location mm-hmm. it's like a storage locker Fine. but a huge big warehouse okay. um, like multiple blocks okay. probably like a mini city okay so rich people store these valuables in a particular lock they have this camera set up mm-hmm. so this are they can actually they'll have a unique code or unique key or something like that they can view it they can make sure if they want to sell it and everything so all these things uh, you know are really becoming an economy in itself got it got and it and if you see a lot of movies like fast and furious and all these heist movies yeah. now <laughs> now they don't target individual people's homes they target these warehouses Boys. and oh, malls oh that is true <laughs> that is very malls. true yeah. yeah and i think uh, same you can do the same thing with digital gold these days right yes gold is also actually like gold certificates so you have a actual companies that store these gold for you they'll they'll give you a certificate a unique id for the amount of money that you have spent on it and you can actually sell it and trade you don't have to have it in your home so you have you solve all these security and storage problems at your home oh, okay got it so and when it comes to the uh, industries like you know wine making or wine connoisseurs and even the industries of uh, digital art like mm-hmm. so there are two new companies that are really uh, doing something new doing it in a different way So when it comes to uh, you know invest people when rich people invest in wine mm-hmm. wine bottles really they age these bottles for hundreds of years mm-hmm. so there is a company called Vino West mm-hmm. who have these uh, all these uh, classical uh, aged wines in a particular warehouse and then um, uh, you can actually invest in these products so it's Vino West Vino West it's okay. a it's actually a company okay. so basically even common people can start investing in their wine collection so you can buy let's say for example they will put up a, something on their website called 1930 aged wine for okay. 100 years aged okay. for 100 years and so on okay. so you can say put i will buy 1% or 0.1% or 2% uh, of that particular uh, i want to own that particular product oh. so you get um, unique ownership proof of ownership okay 
let's say you wait for 30 years or 50 years hmm. and then you give it as a gift or something hmm. and then or you sell it at a later point and you really the value of a wine always increases as it ages right so so when you say the point 1% or point some yeah. percent fractional ownership fractional ownership for wines so basically any product right mm. so uh, for example like just how we have apartments mm. so we have you can't buy a land huh. so you you build 50 houses in that particular piece of land and you sell it piece by piece I... just like that mm. people can come together huh. as a group huh. or as a group of friends or a group of strangers huh. they can come together there's a, uh, a concept called uh, decentralized asset, uh, ownership. Understood, understood. So they come together, they form, uh, they buy a particular product and mm. they own pieces of it. No, but uh, forgive me for my ignorance, mm. but when you say a part of a wine, does, does it mean like a glass full or does it See, mean... See, you're not buying to drink it. Okay. If you want to buy it for drink it, you pay with the whole price of the wine. Okay, okay. Basically, generally wine is something like you you don't buy in individual bottles okay. unless you're for gifting or some purposes. Huh. But think of it as a pack of wine. I don't know, it's called a rack of wines. I don't know what's the oh, right Oh, okay, term. in that, in that crate uh, sort of crate, thing. Crate, yeah, crates okay. of wines. Okay. okay, that's the right. <laughs> okay. So you buy, you invest in those kind of things. Oh, okay. So when actually, for example, uh, let's say a restaurant or a you know, really posh restaurant wants to buy that crate of wine, oh. they will not buy one bottle of wine. They'll ah. buy a crate. They'll oh. buy a collection. Okay, now I understand because I was thinking, <laughs> uh, do they buy like one glass? So that one uh, glass is probably like in ML? future. Yeah, it may come up, but I don't know. Oh, okay, okay, understood, understood. You, you buy in crates. And you know, I was like thinking, uh, so. Uh, all of this crypto NFTs mm. that are coming into the picture these days. Um, I understand that there is a level of security that exists in it, which makes it very popular and which yeah. makes it trustworthy. Yeah. But I don't ex completely understand what makes it so secure. So yeah. can you like explain that a little bit? So the whole concept is of technology called blockchain. Mm -hmm. Blockchain is like a ledger. It's like just like how we have profit and loss accounts and you know uh, balance accounts, right. all these uh, terminologies in accounting. So it's a digital accounting practice where every entry is, uh, you know, uh, entered like, uh, for example, any transaction that is created, who is the buyer, who is the seller, everything is recorded. And let's say a particular product is sold by a particular factory. They will have a, uh, their sale transaction mm -hmm. is recorded in the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So they will create a unique code for it. Mm -hmm. And it will have two pieces, the buyer and seller. Oh. And then uh, that will be attached. Let's say it's a digital uh, contract. Okay. Now that particular one, if you, let's say you're selling that product to someone else. Right. And then you use the same code. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you attach another piece of code next to that particular chain and create a chain of it. Okay. And then to that, again, the previous buyer will become the seller and then the new buyer is attached and you have a chain. Oh. So using a unique code, you can pull that history right. immediately. Right. So and everything is public. Okay. And all these authentications are done by different, different uh, software products contracts or software uh, authenticators or verifiers or so on. Okay. There can be different entities involved. Oh, okay. And generally the cryptocurrency is done in such a way that the verification of currency, but here it can be any kind of a contract. So just like how we digitally sign documents, it's pretty much the same as that. Oh, understood. Okay, now I get it. So we talked about what are digital assets and we talked about how uh, all of these uh, digital content can create a digital economy. But what can't be digital assets. I mean, there's nothing excluding, uh, nothing that excludes anything to become a digital asset. Anything that is digital asset is basically something that created out of bits and bytes. Okay. Created on the computer, created by a person or created even by an AI. That is what we, and it's a native digital asset. Right. But the, we can also have physical products in the real world like oil, water, wines, or comic books, collectibles, physical collectibles, like old that has been there for the past mm. 100 antiques. years, antiques. Mm. Uh, if you want, you can't digitize, we can't, we don't call them as digital assets, but we really can go through a process where we can make a, a digital contract for them, establish uh, history, authenticity, and then we can convert them into something like a, a digital presence. Okay, okay. But we do, generally don't call them as digital assets. These are real assets, mm -hmm. gold, silver, mm -hmm. commodities. Mm -hmm. They're real assets, they're traded real, in the real world. We do it electronically, but we don't call them as digital assets. Understood, understood. So uh, basically, whatever has limited, uh, uh, whatever exists in limited quantities, and that uh, which can generate value is basically an asset, which which is what we've seen from like the first episode, right? Uh, 
asset has I mean not 100% true what it is really true like anything that has scarcity has a value to it mm-hmm. but uh, when it comes to water water is everywhere around the world mm-hmm. but water is valuable because it's, uh, it, it's we need it for drinking right right okay it's so, a necessity it's huh? a necessity uh-huh. so that's what creates a value out of it people will always pay for it or people will always need it and uh, people put a price on it mm-hmm. gold is always will be valuable because it is a kind of a traditional currency has been there for lots of generation it has been the metal is really useful for so many other products that we create in the real world and then it has a store of value so people put a value to it that's why it's called an asset like uh, even with digital art uh, because people say because lots of people say that it is valuable which is why it's become an asset right true in for that. example in countries like india people may not buy or really value art mm-hmm. not, not in the public public may not value it okay. so there will be a niche set of people who really value art or even music mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like everyone listens to music mm-hmm. uh, the music the musician gets a royalty mm-hmm. but uh, some some people don't really treat music as an uh, you know as a value to it there is right. no value to it right 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 but there is there's an industry behind it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so there are there's a lot of people it's a niche industry in india it is very limited but in we take in the whole world music industry is really big mm-hmm. and the musical art is a, it's a digital art in itself mm-hmm. you create a unique uh, you know uh, an id for that particular product mm-hmm. and then you can market it and and you copyright it and it has a value to it mm-hmm. in the same way with you know in the academic industry as well mm-hmm. so research that is done mm-hmm. research papers mm-hmm. and uh, research papers that needs to be verified and validated by so many other people oh. and things like that mm-hmm. probably in the public domain not many people will value it mm-hmm. but in the research domain academic domain those research papers are really really important mm-hmm. and you need those research papers to really for example for a new product or something you need to get a patent mm-hmm. only then you have an exclusive right or something for a few years and things like that. so all right. these things really have value and even the patent uh, process and everything is becoming digital these days okay okay so to me it's interesting how nfts basically nfts are clips just video clips Uh, not just video clips photos pictures content. yeah some any, some any digital content digital content and because a lot of people like us have said that there is value to it we have uh, assigned value to it uh, yeah. so and there's not a lot of people there's a very set of niche people right for now for, for now. now yeah and it's very unusual it's it's yeah. not your usual type of asset but it has it is slowly you know making its way to the mainstream i'm not mm. saying that it's there but it's slowly making its way there's a lot there. of noise there's a lot of uh, you know discussions and things around mm-hmm. that is big, big i mean uh, around nfts mm-hmm. lot of traditional people who do investing don't consider nfts as anything really. right yeah, yeah yeah true and uh, uh, so uh, nfts is one thing and even crypto because it's uh, relatively new yeah. uh, there are not a lot of people who are still you know interested or you know think that it's something that's valuable because right now it's uh, at a low point also right uh, that happens uh, crypto goes through cryptocurrencies goes through a lot of cycles it has mm-hmm. its own ups and downs mm-hmm. it is very unpredictable mm-hmm. uh, the most of the criticism that people have with crypto is it doesn't have any real world use case it's mm-hmm. not solving any problem okay but the why the people really value cryptocurrencies or nfts in that ways they value the technology behind it mm-hmm. this technology is something that is really really useful and this has a lot of other use cases just like how uh, you know the electric tech, electric car technology is really really valuable that's why tesla is really highly valued right. it is not that tesla is one of the largest car manufacturers in the world right. that is not why tesla is one of the really popular or really high market cap uh, company in the mm-hmm. world got it got it so the, the what they see is the patents the technology electric technology the battery technology and that is what they are valuing it and they are putting it a amount and then the share price is so high mm-hmm. so what the crypto industry and nft industry is saying is that all these uh, uh, pictures of uh, animals or uh, any picture that you create right. generally does not have any value to it right right but the thing is the technology is really valuable mm-hmm. and it's a kind of a fashion or a fad mm-hmm. and just like how in the olden days uh, like physical art like a painting is valuable who gives a value to it it's all the values nay of the beholder uh, got it got so, it so just like that is for nft so mm-hmm. nfts and cryptocurrencies and all these things are just a fad for now mm-hmm. but all the technology behind it and the people who are really uh, investing their time and energy behind it have some real world use cases or some ideas they think that this will be really catch on in the next 10 20 ah, years okay i understand 
so recently the budget was announced for the current year and uh, there was a discussion about regulating uh, cryptocurrency so what, how do you think the governments will regulate cryptocurrency and what will happen when you actually start these regulations so as of now yeah the cryptocurrency and the nft world is completely unregulated the only thing the government has done now is announced taxation mm-hmm. so any kind of trading activity that you have you can't offset your losses mm-hmm. uh, and you can you have to pay tax 30% tax so that's what they have declared now but that doesn't mean that the government is making it legal Oh. So l- being legal and being taxed are two different things. Okay. So the actual accounting thing is that even if you're doing some illegal things, mm-hmm. you can be uh, put in jail for not paying tax. Oh. So even if you're doing you have an illegal income or an illegal income stream, you have to pay tax. So just because government says they're going to do 30% tax on some particular cryptocurrency or crypto related activity doesn't mean they're making it legal. that's interesting so yeah there's a lot of uh, thing but the thing is they are considering a bill of mm. how to regulate this industry but general uh, you know uh, people you know all the people who are in the crypto world are saying that the whole point of a cryptocurrency is to deregulate from government so mm. keep that particular because there is no trust in the banking system mm. so that's why the cryptocurrency was itself started mm-hmm. but the blockchain has a really good use case it has a really good nice technology it has different use cases that even governments can use but uh, they really don't trust the government so they want this to keep out of the government purview understood so government will try to regulate it mm-hmm. basically will try to protect some of the people who really are trying who are trying to get into it and lose their money or lose okay. their house over it okay. they try to uh, come in, come up with some regulations to, to protect some people losses. okay we protect people yeah but yeah venture capitalists and other investors or people who have been really all the developers who are really developing applications and coming up with use cases and things like that they are not worried about it because they think that uh, you know all these things we want uh, whatever happens in the government regulates this is a really nice use case this is a really nice thing to invest your time in and the first comers always will get the first benefits true true and is it usually the case that you know regulations usually come at when when it's way too late Uh, yes yeah. regulations come in always government will take its time to regulate by the time it will become so popular that eventually after at the end of let's say most of the uh, people who uh, you know uh, really like crypto all, also say this that all if all the people are doing it government does not have any other option but to you know regulate it. and after regulation yeah the earnings and whatever you can earn what you can do will be little less but it's mainly for investor protection okay okay understood one of the main reasons why the government wants to regulate it because it affects it could affect the stability of the economy so because uh, governments have complete uh, authority over how money is used and how money can be transacted reserve bank and yeah they have a country uh, we have some border and we have different currencies how it can be transacted from one currency to the other Th- that's why they have this complete control over the how currency is used cryptocurrency was introduced to bypass all these things mm. and uh, because they the trust in the government was low during the 2007 2008 uh, mm. financial uh, crisis crisis mm. uh, and the main thing is um, now the government is trying to regulate it and uh, the regulations will be coming in different different ways mm. so they will have uh, they are still not sure how to exactly regulate it so the thing is uh, one of the main things they are really concerned about is uh, these cryptocurrencies you can actually let's say you pay $1000 you convert it into a cryptocurrency and you give a loan mm-hmm. and then when you give a loan of a cryptocurrency to someone else mm-hmm. and then for example you start a fixed deposit with the cryptocurrency mm-hmm. let's say for example some companies are trying to have this idea that cryptocurrencies can be uh, you can deposit cryptocurrencies in a particular company and they will pay you kind of uh, interest okay okay it's called an yield okay so when they pay you an yield so that that becomes like you are earning money from your holding of your cryptocurrency right, so just right. like how you put money in a savings bank or a, any kind of a banking account and then you earn interest so uh, in some companies are thinking of doing this with cryptocurrencies also so once this becomes regular that is when uh, there is a real uh, crisis that could be happening soon because right. of the economic stability right and that is when regulations have to really kick in yes borrowing is a I mean, one of the main concerns borrowing and getting yield and things like that mm-hmm. but people like kevin o'leary mm-hmm. uh, you know they really like this idea of uh, you know because 
let's say in some modern economies like us and europe you put your let's say money in a bank you don't even get 1% of interest mm-hmm. so almost zero mm-hmm. so savings accounts are not generating yield mm-hmm. so they are thinking of moving their companies are thinking of moving their uh, cash to these cryptocurrencies and they can get a yield of at least 4% or 5% in countries like developing economies like india china or probably something we may get a little bit more yield because of the high inflation mm-hmm. we are developing economies mm-hmm. but developed economies really don't give any interest so when these kind of things become regular so that is when governments will really you know kick in with stronger regulations to prevent those things and uh, yeah chinese companies have uh, sorry chinese government has come up with already really uh, a lot of regulations to mm-hmm. prevent these kind of trading in cryptocurrencies mm-hmm. and that was one of the main reasons for the crash of cryptocurrency in a few months or a few, well, last year as well oh okay okay and then that is the main cause so trading has really limited and some companies have uh, need to stop working on these countries to stop uh, you know promoting these kind of things in their countries yeah i think china has this thing that you know uh, uh even if it's a company you know that's operating on their own if uh, let's say it's a mining company and they struck gold yeah and so they can the take it off. they can, can say that it belongs to the public and uh-huh. they can ask uh-huh. you to shut down and move away uh-huh. and the regulation that's the same thing that can happen in uh, you know with any of the companies that trying to do uh, a business which is not in, uh, like liked by the government so they can bring in any kind of leg- regulation mm-hmm. and generally uh, Uh, sometimes it's protecting uh, the investors to get into something like manic bubbles mm-hmm. economic bubbles or mm-hmm. something like that mm-hmm. they want to prevent those scenarios mm-hmm. but at the end of the day they want to retain control mm-hmm. government wants to retain control and less there was a lot of economic bubbles in the 1999 right. and then we had a financial crisis 2007 right. so there are a lot of difference 1999 2000 economic bubble was mainly because of these manias in software companies and 2007 was because of the government Uh, oh. not doing uh, managing money properly or not doing financial products properly and and creating a crisis oh, right. so these two things so government is worried about scenarios like 99 2000 there's a lot of mania and then a lot of people will lose their money mm-hmm. and then the st- uh, market will crash mm-hmm. and a lot of people will get affected the cryptocurrency enthusiasts are mm-hmm. worried about scenarios like financial crisis to banking crisis banking industry crisis government induced crises so that's why they are backing these cryptocurrencies we have two different uh, storylines that is going on oh, as of now so we'll see how it uh, evolves over the next 10 or 20 years and i think that's a good spot to end it there today thank you for listening to bob and type talk please consider following us on our instagram and facebook pages for weekly summaries and illustrations of the topics discussed on the podcast if you found this episode informative please like share and subscribe